Able Archer 83, a nuclear war avoided. Lessons of the past lost today. The cause of the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine is not entirely clear, but the ongoing discussions of Ukraine emission in NATO is considered a factor in the Russian decision. The emission of Ukraine into NATO was not imminent, but was a topic that was part of high-level NATO discussions since, 20, two, since 2008. The isolation of Russia starting, af, starting after the results of the 2016 U.S. presidential elections severely curtailed communication between Russia and the West. This left open the possibility of misunderstandings of intentions between the two sides, with their long-standing suspicion of each other. Just over 40 years ago, the West and the Soviet Union almost stumbled into a nuclear war because both sides misread each other's intentions. The narrow avoidance of nuclear war and its lessons have apparently been lost on the current world leaders. NATO conducted a command post exercise annually called Able Archer. Able Archer was an exercise to practice procedures for launching a retaliatory nuclear strike in response to a Warsaw Pact invasion. As a side note, Warsaw Pact was not used in the exercise, but they were called the Orange Team and NATO was called the Blue Team. In 1983, the exercise designated Able Archer 83 added elements to the exercise that included new procedures in secure communications, new codes, periods of radio silence, and the participation of some NATO head of state. The exercise started November 7, 1983 and ended in November, on November 11, 1983. The script that year was that the rising international tensions with proxy wars in Syria, South Yemen, and Iran escalating and Yugoslavia switching from the Eastern Bloc to the Western Bloc. This led to the invasion by the Warsaw Pact of Finland, Norway, and West Germany and included the use of chemical weapons in West Germany. The exercise called for the U.S. to eventually assume DEFCON 1, which is a nuclear forces on high alert with nuclear war considered imminent. This was due to the use of chemical weapons and its escalatory eventually requiring a nuclear response. This was the goal of the exercise to manage the escalation from conventional to nuclear war and the procedures to launch a nuclear strike. NATO had announced the exercise well in advance, and it was not the first time that the exercise had been conducted. However, 1983 was a particularly tense year in the Cold War. Longtime leader Leonid Brezhnev had passed away in 1982 and was replaced by the already ailing head of the KGB, Yuri Andropov, who, by the way, had never visited the West. The U.S. under President Ronald Reagan, who was sworn into office in 1981, was in year two of the largest peacetime defense buildup. This included the announcement of the Strategic Defense Initiative, more commonly known as Star Wars. There was also a provocative speech on the arms race by Reagan, where he called the Soviets the evil empire, and the decision to deploy nuclear-capable cruise missiles, and more importantly, medium-range Pershing II nuclear missiles to Western and Southern Europe to counter the Soviets' intermediate-range RSD-10 Pioneer NATO designation SS-20 nuclear missiles. The Soviets were early in their their war in Afghanistan, which in itself was turning into a proxy war. The Soviets had dedicated two years under Andropov when he was still the head of the KGB to gather intelligence on U.S. nuclear first strike capability. This was due to the Soviet suspicion that the West was going to launch a first strike against the Soviet Union. They were collecting this information to feed into a new computer-generated process to predict when NATO was going to launch a nuclear attack so the Soviets would know when to launch a preemptive nuclear first strike. This This process required a vast intelligence network of human intelligence and improved satellite capability that was, quote, complemented by Soviet suspicions and paranoia that were, near their, that were near their highest point of the Cold War. The U.S., for its part, was acting aggressively, or at least historically aggressively, uh, that had not been seen since the 1950s and 1960s. The U.S. Navy had conducted an exercise that was meant to elicit a Soviet response to, te- to test Soviet radar capabilities and reaction times. 
that included a carrier strike group to sail through the Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom gap, and they were able to do so undetected and operate off the Soviet Kola Peninsula. The U.S. Navy Pacific Fleet conducted the largest naval exercise since World War II in the North Pacific, with the fleet operating between the Aleutian Islands and the Soviet Kamchatka Peninsula with the goal to provoke the Soviets. This included F-14 overflights of a Soviet military base and the Kuril Islands and to conduct simulated bombing runs. The U.S. Strategic Air Command, SAC, conducted simulated bombing raids on Soviet territory by flying right up to Soviet airspace and breaking off just before penetrating the airspace. These started in 1981 and ran through the current crisis of 1983. The tensions significantly escalated in September 1983, when on the night of September 1st, the Soviet Union shot down a Korean airline flight, KAL-007, and route to Seoul via Anchorage over the Sea of Japan near the Sakhalin Island. The flight had strayed into Soviet-restricted airspace, and the Soviets launched fighters to identify the aircraft and intercept it. Warning shots were fired, but no response from KAL, with the suspicion that tracers were not used in the warning shots, and this and the warning shots occurred at night. The fighters were subsequently ordered to shoot down the aircraft using an air-to-air missile. The Soviets accused the U.S. of deliberate provocation to test its air defenses, and the U.S. accused the Soviets of hindering the investigation. The result of the incident was 269 passengers and, passengers and crew on the airline, including a U.S. congressman from Georgia, Larry McDonald, were all killed. The next incident happened on the night of September 26, 1983, when the Soviet satellite missile launch warning system, codenamed OCO, reported an ICBM launch from the U.S. against the Soviet Union. The Soviet officer on duty ignored the warnings when ground radars did not corroborate the launch. The system was new and prone to error, and the Soviet officer, Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov, knew that an ICBM attack from the U.S. would not be a single missile, but hundreds to thousands of missiles. Later that night, OCO reported four more launches that were also ignored. The missile warnings did not ma- did make it up to the Soviet high command, and though the launches were false, Petrov's actions were scrutinized by his chain of command because of the ongoing suspicions of, the, of U.S. intentions. The next instance was the U.S. invasion of Grenada on October 25, 1983. The invasion did not involve the Soviet Union directly, but demonstrated a new U.S. assertiveness on the world stage. It did involve the Soviet client state of Cuba, which which had military advisors on the island when the U.S. invaded. The Soviets also noticed that during the invasion, there was an increase of secure communications between the U.S. and U.K. that they misinterpreted as coordination. This would play into their suspicion during Abel Archer in November. The communications, in reality, were protests from Queen Elizabeth II and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher over the U.S. decision to invade a member of the British Commonwealth of Nations without consultations. This was the background when Abel Archer 83 started in November. The exercise was an annual exercise, but the Soviets becoming wary of NATO intentions had speculated that a nuclear first strike on the Soviet Union from the West could be camouflaged as an exercise. KGB observers reported that they witnessed nuclear weapons being loaded on the NATO aircraft at the start of the exercise, which would, be not, which would not be part of a command post exercise. This set into motion a Soviet alert that led to preparations of nuclear response, including putting forces in Eastern Europe and the Western Soviet Union on standby to launch a nuclear attack. The response included loading nuclear weapons onto bombers and the deployment of mobile long-range missiles to their launch locations. The Soviet leadership taking fragment and possibly misinterpreted data from the field and the new nature of the communication of Able Archer 83, which included new ciphers, more communications between the US and UK, played right into the paranoia about Western intentions. Most of the leaders of the Soviet Union were elderly veterans of World War II and were trained to have suspicion of the West after having been invaded twice since 1914. The wretched attentions of 1983 played into their worst Soviet fears as Able Archer started in 
or was it an intentional escalation? Yuri Andropov was a Soviet hardliner, and he may have used this exercise to justify arms race with the West and to match the defense spending of the U.S. This is an alternate theory, however, that the idea is with the, that the Soviets were close to launching a nuclear attack on NATO. The U.S., for its part, were aware of the Soviet nuclear activities during Abel Archer, but proceeded with the exercises planned. The U.S. attitude was the Soviet threats and paranoia were not going to deter the U.S. and NATO from conducting readiness exercises. The U.S. did modify the exercise by not allowing President Reagan, Vice President George H.W. Bush, or Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger to participate because it was too provocative and risky based on the determination of the National Security Council. The U.S., after the exercise in late 1983, started receiving indications that the Soviets' preparations were a real response to Abel Archer and that the exercise did put NATO and the Warsaw Pact very close to an unintended nuclear war. This shocked President Reagan, who wrote into his diary that he was surprised that the Soviets were so suspicious of the West that they believed that the U.S. would launch an unprovoked first strike against the Soviet Union. This realization did lead to a reduction in rhetoric and provocations in the following year. Abel Archer 83 brought the world closer to a nuclear war at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. The chance of a preemptive nuclear strike by the Soviets against the West, whether real, fear, or a manufactured act by Yuri and Trovhoff, demonstrated that by the end of 1983, suspicions by the Soviet Union had put the world on a nuclear hair trigger. Despite the rhetoric coming from the West and Russia, the crisis in the Ukraine is not as dangerous as a time as the fall of 1983. The one part that is the same is that neither the West nor Russia have learned or maybe just forgotten the lessons of 1962 or 1983 when misreading the other side's intent, can lead to an unnecessary international tension and risk wider wars.